I know God has something great for us today, so let's pray, let's get into his word together, and uh, we're just going to experience what he has to speak to our hearts today. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you that we get to study and grow and understand better the resurrection and what it means for our lives. I just pray, Lord, you know what we need. Lord, sometimes what we need, we don't even know what we need, but you do, and I pray that, God, we would just know as we leave today, we've gotten exactly what you intended to give us today. So I pray that you would open up our minds and our hearts to receive the very things your spirit wants to drop into our lives today. And so we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, happy Resurrection Sunday. We're glad and excited about what God is doing in our service and how he's moving in our hearts already. And I know he he has, and he's going to continue to do that. Um, And I just know that he's given us um, a message today that's really going to challenge us, but also just blow us away, I hope. And uh, and so we're going to be talking about beauty from ashes. And if you really think about our culture today, uh, we just, we are attracted to beauty, right? I mean, it's just everywhere around us, we are, are obsessed with beauty, if you think about it, and we love beautiful things. In fact, um, probably many of you today, I'm looking out, and I know you look better than you normally do on a normal Sunday. <laughs> I don't know what that says about last week, but man, everyone looks good. But why? We dressed up because we're hoping to get our pictures taken with our families today. Some of us had, a, you know, that spouse or that parent that made us dress up today. And, and, and you know, just turn to your neighbor and say, you look good. <laughs> And it's good to be able to look good, right? So, so here's what I know. You know, uh, I, I think about this. I watch my kids and how they approach how they look differently than we do. You know, my kids, they'll wake up, they'll have the bed head going on, they'll still be in their pajamas, they'll look in the mirror and they'll think, I look good. <laughs> My, my daughter, like, she has no sense of taste right now. So the other day, she had, like, this pink outfit on. I said, go pick out your socks. She comes back, and they're, like, forest green socks with pink. And I'm like, really? Like, that's what you picked? She's like, Dad, but it looks good. <laughs> and she's, like, proud and walking around to wear that outfit. And, and why? They just don't care what other people think about them, right? And, and there's something that we can learn from kids. In fact, the Bible teaches us this, that we are, if we're going to really come to know God, then we're going to have to be like little children. In fact, it says this in Matthew 18, 3, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And one day as I was trying to memorize that verse, as you're trying to memorize verses, one thing you do is you, you take each word and you digest it a little bit more. And I really came across the idea that in order for me to become like a child, I have to change. How many of you know change doesn't just happen? You have to make a choice to change. And so there are just times in our life that if we're going to become like children and really get to see God, then we're going to have to learn from them and change and be more like them. And, and one of them is just how, they're, how they look beautiful and they know they're beautiful just because God made them, right? And that's all that matters. But we like other beautiful things too, right? Some of you, you picked your cell phone based on how beautiful it was and you put a nice beautiful case on it to make it even prettier and shiny and sparkly. Maybe for some of you, it's that big purse that fits the whole world in there and that's beautiful to you, right? Uh, most of us, we picked our car based on how beautiful it was because we knew we were gonna drive around in it and, and let me just tell you, at some point you get to an age where you realize that a minivan is beautiful. <laughs> And don't knock it, because some of you will find that to be incredibly true about how beautiful they become. But truthfully, we love beautiful things, right? And we could just go on and on and on. But here's what I know about beautiful things. Eventually, all the beautiful things we ever have turns to ashes, including us. And that's where we have to really kind of go, okay, well, what's going on there? And the Bible Really, as we begin to look and study the Bible, you begin to see like God created beautiful things. And throughout the Bible, he depicts some of these things as gardens. And the very first garden was created, was found in the book of Genesis as the Garden of Eden, right? As beautiful, flawless, perfect, right? Until Adam and Eve 
sinned. And when Adam and Eve sinned, God banished them from that beautiful garden and, and from that paradise. And so from that moment on, there has become this downward spiral of us going from beauty to ashes. And that's just true of every one of us. There's also, in Scripture, the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and some of us, again, were here on Friday, and we walked through this, right? In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus suffered in agony and prayer over what was ahead of him. The suffering that he, would, he knew he was going to take, that was worse than any other suffering people had gone through in this world. And he was willing to do it. Why? To please the Father and for us. He says the joy that was set before him, right? The cross, he knew, and it was for us. And there's a, a third garden, though, that I want us to begin with today, and that is maybe it could be called the Garden of Sweet Victory. And this is the garden that is depicted in the Gospel of John, which we're celebrating today. John 20, verse 1 through 2 says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. He's missing, right, in the garden. And so if we drop down to verse 11, and I'm just skipping some verses for time's sake, it says, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over and looked at the t into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not recognize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned toward and cried in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have yet to be ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had, what he had said to her, these things. And so you see in this the depiction of the garden of the sweet victory. Why? Because here Jesus was buried in the tomb. They sealed it up. They thought like he was dead. But three days later, what? He came back to life, defeating it once and for all, because death could not hold him in the grave. <laughs> and that is what we celebrate on Easter. And I am really praying that today we begin to grow in our understanding and the scope of what it means that God rose again from the dead and how that changes our lives and, and fills us. And that by the end of today, we can declare, as Mary says, I've seen the Lord. I know he lives. And so that's what we're striving to reach today. Let's kick off, though, with, with the heart of this message by turning to a passage in Isaiah. Isaiah was an incredible prophet in the Old Testament that prophesied much about Jesus and what he would come to do. And we read this in Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified." I want to give you a little bit of the context of how this pro prophecy was given. Israel had been uh, disobeyed God, and so they were exiled into Babylon, but God was bringing them back into the land of Israel. And as they came back into the land of Israel, they saw what was done, the destruction that was done. They burned the city down. They burned the temple. It was literally, uh, the whole city was a big ash heap. That's it. It was a, a, a heap of ruins. And, and so as you imagine, what they left was beautiful. And they're coming back to all of this destruction. And they're incredibly discouraged because they remember what it used to be. And it looks nothing like what it used to be. They remember the beauty. And now that beauty lays in ruins. And the worst part is, is they knew that this was what God had warned them about. It wasn't a surprise. 
God actually had warned them, hey, if this is how you're going to live, this is the destruction that's going to come your way. And so they had turned away from them and they turned away from the freedom that God had given them, the life God had given them to a life of being in prison and destroyed and seeing their city destroyed. What happened to the Israelites is a picture of what often happens to you and I. See, God makes us beautiful and we turn and rebel against God. And the thing is, is God lets us choose. He doesn't force us to follow him. But he has warned us that if we turn away from him, it will lead us back into prison and into, into captivity, and we lose our freedom, and it opens us up to destruction. And so I think it's important to understand what is really going on in our lives when we find ourselves in that situation, when they're captive, when they're held in prison, when things are destroyed in our lives. And I think it's a lot of us, we misread that situation. We get it wrong. Here's what John 10.10 10 teaches us. It says, the thief comes only to kill and to steal and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. What often happens to a lot of us is when we see the destruction around us, when we see things in our lives stolen or destroyed, what do we tend to do? A lot of times we tend to blame God, right? God, why did you do this to me? But scripture teaches us that this, the work of God actually leads us to life. The work of Satan, on the other hand, leads us to a diminished life. And so here's where a lot of people don't get it. Satan can't work in our lives without our cooperation. By the way, neither can God. Do you realize that? Satan or God can't work in our lives without our cooperation. We have to cooperate with him. That means what we're experiencing right now sheds light on who we're serving. If we're experiencing that destruction, that prison, who are we cooperating with? It's not God. If we're cooperating with God, he brings life into our situation in our life. If we're cooperating with the enemy, the spiritual enemy of our souls, then guess what's going to follow? This death and destruction and all of these things that take away our life because we have a real spiritual enemy who's searching to kill, steal, and destroy. So instead of blaming God, back up and realize, wait, what's going on? Am I serving God? If I'm serving God, there's going to be a different outcome. Now, the Bible always starts with the bad news first. And, and I know we don't like that, but it's important that we deal with the bad news first because guess what? We are in a mess and we have to acknowledge the mess we're in because anyone who doesn't recognize the mess they're in, they're not going to accept they need a savior. You may want help in your life to make things better. A lot of people do that. God, come in and make my life better, right? Uh, we might want help in God coming in to, to give us success or exempt us from pain or suffering. You know what? Scripture doesn't teach us that that's what God does. God doesn't come in just to make your life better. Some of you have tried God and you dropped him because he didn't fulfill your expectations of what you wanted him to do in your life. But could it be that you've approached God all wrong? Can I say it this way? God isn't an add-on to our lives. Amen. Our lives are in ruins apart from him. That is the truth. And until we see that, we're really only coming to God to save us from the ruins that we see and not even from just saying, God, I need to be saved. It's easy to want to use God instead of surrendering to him. And that's what a lot of people do. They just want to use God to make their life better. He's an add-on. But what is pictured here is Israel's coming into the city mourning over the heaps of ashes in their midst. They're mourning about the mess around them, and they're filled with this heaviness and despair. And maybe that describes some of you today. You come in here, and sure, it's Easter, and on the outside, you look good. We've already established that, right? That we look good. But on the inside, you don't look so good at all. You're a mess. It's in that mess, though, that Isaiah gives this prophetic word, that God is going to send somebody someday to set the prisoners free, to turn their ashes to beauty, to turn their mourning into joy, and to remove that spirit of heaviness and replace it with praise. In other words, God's going to trade their ashes for beauty. The ugliness of their situation, he's going to turn around and make beautiful. He's going to take their joy and give them his amazing love, and he's going to replace all that heaviness with his joy. 
And in the Jewish culture, ashes were a symbol of sorrow and grief and despair. Those are, that's really what is signified by the ashes. That's why throughout the Bible, when people go into a time of mourning, what you see is, is the Bible de- describes they often put on sackcloth, which was really this, like a potato sack, wouldn't be comfortable, it'd be itchy, very uncomfortable, and they would heap ashes on their heads because they would be there sitting in mourning. Now, if you think about what ashes are, what are are ashes? Ashes are the very remains of fuel that is burned up, right? So what what they're really throwing ashes on is, is my life is in despair, all of my life is burned up, and maybe, again, that's how you feel today, but... While ashes are useless, what does the promise of God say? God says, I'm going to give you beauty for ashes. I think we read that quickly and think, well, yeah, I want the beauty part. God, make me beautiful, right? Like, I'm all for the beauty. But listen, God says, to get my beauty, there's an exchange process that happens. You give me your ashes, I give you my beauty, And unless you give God your ashes, guess what? You don't get God's beauty. There's this substitution plan in place. And some of us, we keep holding on to our ashes and we wonder, where is the beauty? Where is the beauty? But it's because we're not making the exchange. We're not giving God the mess we have and letting him make us beautiful. Jesus offers to give us the beauty of his own life and replaces the ashes of our life with his beauty. That's what the promise is. But it gets even better because there's more promises that he gives us. The second promise in our passage is that he gives us oil of joy for mourning. I think it's very interesting that Satan's, one of his most successful lies is to convince people that if you follow God, your, your life is going to be mourning. No more fun for you, right? <laughs> That's what following Jesus is like, the soup Nazi. <laughs> Can I tell you, though, why so many people believe this lie? It really falls on Christians. Too many of us are part-time Christians living boring lives. And we're not honoring God. We know what we can't do, but we don't do what we're called to do. That's part-time Christian. God told us things we're not supposed to do, but he's told us so many more things that we are to do. And if you think that a boring Christian life is is really what it's all about, you're wrong. Read the book of Acts. Get in our study on Wednesday night as we study through the book of Acts. Acts is nothing boring. It's not even close to being boring. These people were on an adventure for God, going through all kinds of exploits and seeing God move in incredible ways. And people kept signing up to be a part of it. The Bible says that God added to their number daily those who were being saved. Why? Because God's exciting. And listen, one of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. And if you're a Christian and you have a joyless life, you're not living it right. Because if you were living it right, you would have this joy that would be bubbling over in your heart and life. And if we get back to the context, Isaiah is speaking about this mourning. Why is this mourning there? Well, because of the ruins of the city. That word mourning is what we do when we lose something very precious to us. And Israel's coming back and they're seeing that this precious city that they loved is in ruins. We experience this, right? When we lose a loved one, there's a period of mourning, right? Why? Because this was somebody precious to me. Somebody who's going through a divorce, they experience a season of mourning. Why? Because at one time, this was precious to me. If you have a relationship that dissolves, there's often this time of mourning. And what I want you to understand is is this is normal to life, this mourning. Because when you lose something precious, it makes sense that there would be mourning. In the spiritual sense, though, you and I, we've lost our relationship with God. The most precious thing we could ever have We've lost. And when we become aware of that, there honestly should be the sense of mourning. When we don't mourn over sin, there is a sense of shame. It's actually why Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they weren't mourning over their sin, but there was a sense of shame, so they covered themselves up and they hid from God. We may cover our shame, we may ignore our shame for a while, we may even glory in our shame, but Every time we're in the presence of God, we feel it. That's why some of you don't want to even be in church very often. Because you enter God's presence and there is this shame you feel because you don't mourn your sins. 
Paul says it this way, Philippians 3, 18 through 19, for I have often told you and now say again with tears that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame, and they are focused on earthly things. Let's be honest, today in our culture, people tend to glory in their shame. But as long as you glory in your shame, you're going to miss what God wants to do in your life. The truth is that God has an incredible exchange for us. Our sin should cause us to mourn. And I think of those who were in Good Friday service and they experienced as we nailed our sins to the cross and really contemplated, there was, there was this sense of, of mourning over what we have done to put God on that cross. But we didn't stop at mourning our sins. Because that is not the end. We give God our mourning. And he gives us his joy. A taste of that joy turns your life around because you see how awesome God is. It is not a fair exchange. <laughs> you give God your mourning over your sin and how wretched you are. And you experience his joy of forgiveness. And you see what God redeems, he restores. He takes our mess and he turns it around for his glory. And there's a cool story of, of Jesus healing a man in the Bible that, that is a powerful demonstration of what happens. This man was afflicted with many different demons. He lived in a graveyard, cutting himself, and nobody wanted to be around him. And God walks in, Jesus walks in, heals him, and restores his life. And then he tells him this, go back to your home and tell all what God has done for you. And off he went, proclaiming throughout the town, all that Jesus had done to, for him. See, when God redeems, he restores. He puts us in our right mind, how we were created originally. We may have all these demons in our past and all of this affliction that we went through and people avoided us or people judged us. But listen, when God redeems and restores, he gives us a story to tell. And it's a story of his work. It's a story of the miracle that God has done. And so when a person encounters the miracle of God, they naturally share what God has done. They're not trying to convince you to follow Christ per se. They're just trying to tell you the good news of what he did for them. It's not that then people who witness think they're better than you are. It's that he is better and any true Christian who's witnessing to you an effective way is going to talk about what he has done in their lives because guess what? We're all the same. We're all sinners in need of a savior. And what we proclaim and what we celebrate and what we experience joy of is in what he has done for us on the cross. The last exchange found in this prophecy is that God will give us a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I want to talk about that word spirit of, of heaviness or that word heaviness. It literally means something weak, feeble, or faint. In, in a word picture, it's, it's like a lamp that's getting ready to flicker out because it got to the end of its wick. Have you ever had those times in your life where your strength's just sapped out of you? Where you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders and you feel like you just can't go on anymore? I mean, things can be going well for a while, you ever notice how life happens that way? <laughs> you, you, you really love those moments where it's, it's quiet, nothing bad is happening, but you also kind of like know like, <laughs> okay, when's it gonna happen? <laughs> when's the car gonna break down? When's one of the kids going to get sick? When, when are those hours going to be cut? Or maybe you're, you and your spouse aren't just getting along. And, you, and all of a sudden, when that happens, when all of those things come crashing in, your life is filled with a spirit of heaviness. And honestly, let's, we just know it can happen in an instant, right? And in those moments, Jesus has this incredible invitation for us. He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. What an invitation. Come to me. I have rest for you. So how can we come to God with our weariness and burdens? Well, once again, there's an exchange, right? We've been seeing that in this prophecy. There's this exchange that we give God what we have and God gives us what he has. And God takes our spirit of heaviness and gives us this garment of praise. And I will just say this, I don't think you're going to get rid of your heaviness until you begin to ex exchange it for praise, which is why some people come into church heavy and leave heavy. 
It wasn't that God couldn't work in your life and circumstances. It's that you didn't give him praise. You refused to praise and you held on to your heaviness all through the service. And so you came in with it and you leave with it. I want you to think about a garment for a moment. Thankfully, you're all wearing clothes in here. (laughs) This morning, you put them on, right? You put them on, and what does that mean? They're going to stay with you probably the rest of the day. Until tonight, you put on your pajamas and you go to bed. But throughout the day, you're going to wear these garments. They stay with you. And what God is saying is, is that as his people, you put on the garment of praise. That means you're living your life throughout your day in praise and honor to the Lord. And if you will do that, that spirit of heaviness will not be able to cling to you. If you know people who are filled with praise to God, they're joyful. Why? Because there's an exchange that happens. Don't ever think that in church you just have this opportunity to sing songs. It's not what this is about. We have an opportunity to praise our God for all that he is, all that he's done, and all that he's going to do. Something powerful happens when you lift up your praise to God. Those burdens you came in with, they often just fall off or get smaller than when, they, when you came in with them. And the reason that happens is, is that you've taken your eyes off of your problems, your circumstances, and you place them on the problem solver. Listen, throughout Scripture, we're told to praise the Lord. And it's not because God needs it. He has countless angels who can get that job done. And yet, he invites us to praise him. Why? Because we need it. We need to praise God. And as we begin to praise God, we see who he is and how great he is. And so we are called to give God the praise that is due his name. Listen, as we close today, the whole time I've been talking about this prophetic passage in Isaiah about a person who would come in the future who would do all these things, it leads us right to Jesus. This prophecy was about Jesus the whole time. One Jesus, one day Jesus came and he, he was in his hometown. He walked into the synagogue. He sat down. And when it was his turn to share, they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. It just so happened to be that scroll, right? <laughs> You should know that if you're part of this church. Nothing just so happens. It was divine appointment. And Jesus finds the passage and he reads this in Luke 4, 18 through 21. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone on the synagogue were fixed on him and he began by saying to them, today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. Don't miss it because Jesus just said, hey, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one who's come to set the captives free. I'm on a mission here. And this points to who I am. And he was there to undo the damage that sin had caused. He was, un- to, he was there to undo all that Satan has tried to kill, steal, and destroy Sin breaks our hearts, it imprisons people, it oppresses people, and Jesus is declaring, I am here to deal with all of this once and for all. And he does on the cross when he yells, it is finished. I have paid that price. And that's why this day is such a celebration, because when you finally understand what Jesus came and did, you can't help but fall at his feet completely in love with who he is and what he's done for you and how good he is. Take a look at this passage of scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 57. It says, brothers, I tell you, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and corruption cannot inherit incorruption. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will be changed in a moment, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed For this corruptible must be clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal is clothed 
with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Now the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the hope we have in Jesus. He defeats death once and for all. He takes care of this plague of sin that every one of us has suffered in our lives. And he offers us a chance to exchange the life we know for the one we could only dream of. What you may not have seen is that throughout the passage in Isaiah, what's been really being referenced is this comparison between the difference between a funeral and a wedding. See, at a funeral, a lot of different things take place than at a wedding, right? Which one would you rather be at? (laughs) I do a lot of both, more than the average person, and I will tell you I'd rather be doing or being at a wedding than a funeral any day. When an Israelite would attend a funeral, they would put ashes on their heads. They would be filled with mourning and they would be filled with the spirit of heaviness. That's what you would do at a funeral. But at a wedding, they would all be dressed beautifully. They would be anointing themselves with oil and filled with joy and there would be a lot of praise and rejoicing going on. And the symbolism isn't an accident. Jesus, when he talked about what heaven would be like, he declared it as like a wedding feast that we would look forward when we're finally together with Jesus. In Matthew chapter 22, he describes it as heaven. But listen, when he describes it, he says that all of these people who were invited to his feast, who got the invitation, rejected it. They didn't show up. And so Jesus goes out and he sends his workers into the highways and byways to compel people to come into the party. And as they came in, in that story, it says he gave them new garments to put on. And they wore the wedding garments and were part of the wedding party. And some guy snuck in. And they knew he snuck in. You know why? He's wearing his old clothes. And when he found out this guy snuck in, he was quickly removed from the wedding feast. This whole message has been to show us the amazing things that Jesus wants to do in our lives, how he wants to take and exchange the things that we have and give us something better. He takes our ashes and gives us beauty. He exchanges our mourning and gives us joy. He takes our spirit of heaviness and fills our lives with praise. But let me make this clear to you. He lets us make the choice. He doesn't take those things from us. He simply exchanges it when you and I say, God, here, you can finally have this. And then he gives it to us. John 1.12 says, but to all who did receive him, he gave the right to be children of God. And the story of the resurrection of Jesus is that he came to give us new life. We give him our mess. He transforms it, and we discover that what we thought we would lose turns into a life that comes alive. Would you watch this video, and then I'm going to come back and close.
Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Jesus, Lord, we thank you that today is all about how you bring, you bring us alive. Lord, many of us in this room, we have experienced that you have taken all of our sins and they have been burnt up and our lives are just but ashes. But Lord, in that exchange, we have received new life. And Lord, we can testify to that today. We can thank you for that. And and Lord, I just pray there's a renewed sense of, of just gratefulness. Because we're not all that great, but you're so great. And we are thankful for that. Listen, I don't know where you're at with God today, but I do know that today you've heard the good news presented very clearly to you. And that there is a very clear understanding that we are all sinners and we have all have different areas in our lives that are just a mess. And if you just recognize that, I I just pray that today you understand that Jesus wants you just to lay that mess at his feet. That he wants to take those ashes and give you his beauty and change and transform your life. And it's that simple. That's what he came to do. That was his mission from the very beginning. And if that's you today, again, he won't force you, but he's, he's asking you and inviting you to make this exchange. And so could I lead you in a prayer today where you're sitting just between you and God? Just pray with me, Jesus. I confess that I'm a sinner, God, and Lord, I know my life's a mess. You know it's a mess, Lord, honestly, many times I've come around church or church people and I just, I don't want to even be around because, Lord, I I feel that guilt and that shame. But today I realize that, God, it's because I'm trying to cover that instead of lay it at your feet. And Jesus, I thank you that you are a God who died for the sins of this world, but more importantly, for my sin. And you did what only you could do. And Lord, today I want to receive your gift of salvation, God, that would heal me from the ruins of my own life, God, and begin, Lord, a new life. That I would come alive to the things of you, and to the things you're wanting to do in and through me. And I thank you for your grace and your mercy that your spirit has made very clear to me today. And I rejoice at the new life you've given me. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.